Okay, so in English, our next speaker is one of those guys that uh, have entire team trying to build the pink apps uh, to protect them, and after that, he just comes in and breaks everything. And this repeats over and over again. But his job is very important as the penetration testing is one of the first activities you should do in your company if you are producing software. So uh, our next speaker has experience since year 2010 in penetration testing. He has his own co uh, consultancy company. So please, your applause for Dimitra Shovarjiev. Hi guys. Um, I know it, uh, we 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 talk we, we said that uh, the talk is going to be in Bulgarian. Um, sorry for a little bit of blunder there. It's going to be in English because there are a lot of international guests uh, and a lot of family as well uh, in here. Uh, let me just uh, lock myself out of here. So yeah, right. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, I prepared uh, the presentation in, in half Bulgarian. Uh, as you might know, uh, technical Bulgarian is not really that rich. So, I'm going to translate for, for the international guests. Anyhow, today we're going to talk about uh, penetration testing for fools. Uh, for fools, because every one of us uh, is uh, more or less a fool, and especially if it comes to uh, to security, to information security, just the story of the last hour. Um, I went to vote today. I hope you all do, because uh, uh, democracy is important and every, uh, every vote counts. Anyhow, I went to vote, uh, and as you might know, uh, we are introducing machine voting uh, in Bulgaria. So, um, to my great surprise, uh, just against the, the, the machine, uh, the, it wasn't like in a, what they call white box. Uh, it, it was just a machine that had a large carton around it, uh, which had to, to prevent, uh, to, 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 to uh, take care of your confidentiality, the confidentiality of your vote. So the school camera was looking directly uh, at the terminal. Uh, so yeah, again, information security is important. Uh, and uh, a lot of people say that uh, security through obscurity is a good thing. Uh, I don't think so. I hope you, you have some takeaways from today's lecture, and uh, especially for, for developers, especially for people who are new uh, to the subject, uh, it's going to be uh, like intermediate level friendly, I would say. Right, a little bit about myself. Um, I studied informatics uh, at the Technical University of Sofia um, and the Technical University in Karlsruhe. Uh, after that, I uh, finished my uh, master's in business administration. Um, I used to know a lot about networks, and I was triple CCMP certified. After that, I, I got trained in uh, certified ethical hacking and CISSP, uh, which are security certificates, um, which more or less coincided with my career, which started as a, <laughs> what they used to call webmasters. Uh, at a network company. After that, uh, I, I became an information security officer, uh, security officer at uh, Hewlett Packard for customers like Nokia and Ericsson and uh, Philips. After that, I became a, a business consultant doing math models uh, with a lot of sensitive data for, uh, for uh, customers like Philips and Pfizer. And after that, uh, I started my own uh, company, um, which deals with uh, web development. So this is more or less what I'll be talking about today, pen testing for, uh, for web applications. Uh, now a few words uh, about uh, the Bermuda Triangle of security. Um, as you might uh, have seen those, uh, you can pick two only. Uh, so it it's going to be either expensive, it's going to be uh, user friendly, or it's going to be safe. So choose wisely. Uh, and uh, the decision you are going to make is more or less going to be dependent on the business that you run. Um, so yeah, um, a little bit <laughs> of a spoiler here. I have a few memes uh, in my uh, uh, in my presentation, uh, which are uh, very old jokes, not really funny. Um, first of all, uh, like I said, 
I studied a little bit in Germany. And second of all, if you think information security will be fun, you're in for a bad time. So yeah, uh, next question I'm going to talk about is why it's important to be safe. Uh, the importance of safety is shown here in this diagram. I'm afraid uh, it's not readable for you guys, so I'm going to spell some of things out. These are infor uh, information security leaks, only web application information security leaks. Um, here we have Yahoo uh, with uh, 500 million, uh, with, with a leak of 500 million um, username and passwords in 2000 and, uh, let me check, 2014. Uh, we have uh, a MySpace leak of 104 million. Uh, we have a Brothers leak that was earlier this year, uh, which was like uh, 80 million or something like that. Some of, the, uh, some of those you've heard a lot about. For example, here it says Ashley Madison. Sorry for the low, re er, low res. Um, I'm going to share my slides, and uh, you can take a look at everything here. I, I mention my sources usually. So uh, you can take a look at that and uh, find out. So what the information security guys uh, do, uh, the first step of a penetration test is recon reconnaissance. So um, if I get contracted to, to pen test the company, the first thing uh, to do would be to find out uh, a way in. And uh, a good way in is through some of those leaked accounts. Um, probably you, used, you, you have an account somewhere here. I mean, Contacte or Yahoo or, or MySpace or eBay. So chances are that uh, your password was already leaked if you haven't changed your password or if you use a password rotation. Um, then chances are that uh, you are going to, uh, to get hacked again through the well-known password. There are online portals that, uh, that show you uh, whether your account was leaked or not. Uh, but uh, the main takeaway from this slide here is that uh, you're not safe. You shouldn't rely uh, on the fact that any of your information is safe. So you should uh, always uh, look around for, uh, for vulnerabilities. You need to secure your stuff. Um, here, uh, that's an IBM X-Force report. Um, even though it's, uh, it should be confidential, it was leaked some time ago. So again, <laughs> um, if you try to make uh, an information security report confidential and it's, gonna, and it's getting leaked, then you're not, going, not really doing a good job. Uh, it was leaked, by the way, from the IBM uh, site, where it wasn't secured by any means of authentication or authorization mechanisms. So yeah, anyhow, uh, back to the report. As you can see here, um, the different bubbles signify uh, different uh, impact uh, monetarily, uh, as well as uh, f f by accounts. And uh, the, different, uh, the different colors at the, uh, here signify what type of attack it was. So here we have brute force, watering hole, physical access, phishing, SQLI, SQL injection, sorry. Um, malvertising, so uh, some sort of a clickbait uh, or ad advertisement that uh, leaks uh, malware to your PC. Misconfiguration. Denial of service attack, distributed denial of service attacks, m or just malware. Um, this here is undisclosed. So as you can see, uh, this is, by the way, 2015. Uh, here are the months of 2015. Um, a, a, a pretty simple analysis would show that uh, most of the hacks um, are due to misconfiguration or denial of service attacks. So uh, a lot of applications have uh, very good security mechanisms, but they're misconfigured. So a penetration test would usually find out about those misconfigurations and would, be, would allow you to, to, to fix them because they are really a configuration file. Uh, you shouldn't code. It's, it's, it's very low expense, but uh, you're getting higher and higher up the value chain, so you do, you're not the low-hanging fruit of the information security world. Right. Um, what comes next? We are going to talk about security breaches. Um, and uh, who said web? 35%, uh, the, largest, the largest amount of uh, security breaches comes through web. 
Uh, this is, uh, by the way, uh, uh, again, uh, statistics here are not that important. The important thing is that a lot, like more than a third uh, of, of the security breaches come from the web. So they don't come from uh, dedicated applications. They don't come from uh, uh, from uh, your uh, somehow. They, they are connected to your email usually, but uh, they, they are not directly uh, mail vulnerabilities or something like that. And why would that be? Because it's really easy. Usually, your local area network sits behind two firewalls, and uh, your demilitarized zone with your web service sits just behind one. So it's, in, it's easier access. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You can see that here. Um, and here, um, I've done a lot, uh, some, some statistics of my own. Um, I've taken this data and analyzed it a little bit more. Uh, first of all, I filtered only the web bridges. Um, and the first chart here shows uh, the number of uh, records, total number of records stolen uh, from each organization. By the way, this report is from the beginning of 2015. Sorry. Uh, so this report is from the beginning of 2015, and that's why the 2015 number, which is the green bar, is uh, so low. So we are going to consider uh, 2010 to 2014 only. Um, another thing uh, that uh, the, the data set provided was uh, sensitivity. I altered it a little bit uh, because it had uh, varying weights. So um, I'm using the following sensitivities. Email address or online information that is easily accessible comes with a one. Um, uh, Social security numbers or personal details uh, have, a, have a weight of two. Credit card information a three. Uh, email passwords or health records, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have a uh, have a, a severity of four, and then full bank account uh, full bank account data has a five. So um, as you can see here, even though the number has risen, uh, the severity hasn't lowered. So a lot of people can see, think that. Yeah, there are a lot of breaches, but uh, the breach is of uh, non-critical information, or somehow the sensitivity of the data that's been breached isn't uh, that high. Well, uh, this shows that actually uh, it's fairly constant, and it revolves around three, which is credit card information level of, uh, of data breach. And uh, here I came up with my metric of sensitivity loss, which is uh, really basic. It's number of records stolen times the sensitivity of leaks. So I take each leak, I analyze what the sensitivity of the leak was, and then the number of records stolen. And here you can see that actually the sensitivity lost um, is, is going up as well. So yeah. How would uh, a penetration test help? So first of all, and most important of all, um, it uh, creates conditions of a, of a real threat, real life threat. Uh, usually, if you if you build web applications or you run a company, um, you think that you're prepared uh, for for a full out uh, attack on on your uh, infrastructure through trainings or through a general knowledge of uh, of how a, 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 an attack would work. And uh, there are a lot of considerations in place, but then you, you get the chance to test your team. Usually, a penetration test consists of three teams, um, one of certified ethical hackers, uh, or techs, or whatever, uh, white hats, so-called white hats, uh, which is called the red team, which tries to penetrate your, uh, your application or your network. Then you have the blue team, which is your own team, which tries to defend it. And then you have a purple team, uh, which is actually a mix of both uh, ethical hackers and uh, your team, which actually explain to each other what's going on. So what does uh, the red team do, and then how does the blue team respond? So again, this is uh, some sort of a realistic threat. Um, it tests the, the system for answers, uh, and it allows your team to switch roles with the bad guys. And this is very important, because usually the bad guys uh, don't oblige by the rules, so you get to you get to be the bad guys. You get to uh, to check uh, the the ac the not so sugar coated uh, mirror image of your application. You try to to get in, 
And then uh, it also uh, a penetration test also works as a training, uh, and uh, the, and it passes the knowledge that uh, to the whole team that you shouldn't be the weakest link. You should secure all your points, and you shouldn't be low-hanging fruit out there. So um, what are the types of penetration tests? You have three types of penetration tests, as you had three teams. One is black box, the other one is white box, and the third one is gray box. The difference between them is whether or not you give access uh, to the penetration testers to any knowledge of your, uh, of your network. Uh, the black box testing gives uh, no knowledge whatsoever, so they have to find everything by themselves. The white box gives full access to all details of how the infrastructure is built, uh, what uh, to do the whole code base, and so on and so forth. And they're uh, really able to check all your API endpoints or uh, whatever you have in there uh, for any potential or already verified uh, vulnerabilities. Gray box is somewhere in the middle. It's like a hybrid approach, which tries to maximize uh, the the plus sides of uh, black box and white box, um, and tries to eliminate the, uh, the disadvantages. The disadvantages of black box, by the way, is that it's really, really slow, because nobody, uh, like the, the, the hackers, need to find out a lot of information about you. Um, and then you, you really need to find uh, really good black, uh, really good uh, black box testers, because otherwise they'll tell you that uh, you're safe and you wouldn't be. Uh, with white box testing, um, it's rather slow, but way quicker than, than, than black, box taxi, uh, black box pen testing. But then you need to have full trust of the testing party, because obviously they have uh, the keys to your castle. Talking about effectiveness, um, as you might presume, uh, black box testing has a, a, a very low percentage of actual threats found, uh, but it's also rather cheap. So you just hire, you could also hire freelancers and just ask them to, to pen test you. Then gray box uh, goes a, a wide way uh, in, in, the, in the expense tab, uh, but you'll be able to, to find up to 45% of your, of your vulnerabilities or issues. Um, now, the types of penetration tests, uh, but this was just theoretical uh, types, and these are the, 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 the more practical types of, uh, of pen tests. We have network attacks over here, uh, which are split into exploitations and attacks. So exploitations, you can think about it as uh, vulnerabilities of the, of the hardware or the operating system, and then attacks Let's simplify it and think about it as a DDoS attack. So any sort of actually denial of service attack, it shouldn't be uh, distributed. Uh, so uh, the exploitations usually uh, manipulate the uh, confidentiality or integrity of your data, and uh, the attacks um, eliminate the availability of data. Um, so network attacks would be attacks against the firewall, the intrusion prevention systems, DNS attacks, and other non-web application attacks. Uh, we have the client-side applications, uh, pen, pen testing. We have the configuration pen testing. Uh, sorry, the social engineering. Uh, sorry, uh, so social engineering pen testing when, where you, you test your team. Uh, you test their knowledge in the security domain, for example, against phishing attacks or uh, whether they uh, dump uh, the, the, the whether they recycle, for example, papers or, or invoices properly. Uh, you try to imposter, uh, and then you also have a, a very nice uh, type of attack, which is called uh, uh, threats. For example, you might have an alcoholic on your team, and uh, he might get uh, threatened to, uh, to share some details about uh, your infrastructure or application or whatever, or to leak some data. And then you have the, the web applications. Today we are going to talk about uh, mostly uh, network attacks and uh, web applications. Here's our plan. So first of all, here's, here's the plan of, of, of how a uh, 
information security structured process should look like. So first you have the secure coding, which is actually the most important one. Because if you don't code securely, uh, then the costs for a penetration test, uh, for, for the whole penetration test uh, framework would be extremely high because uh, you have a lot of vulnerabilities to fix over the time. Uh, after that, you have the secure server, you have the secure infrastructure. So first of all, you secure your application by, by coding it, obviously. After that, you have to secure your server. Then you have to secure the infrastructure and uh, all the network devices, et cetera, et cetera, the, the whole environment. Uh, and then you go on and perform an internal audit, which is also in scope of today's, uh, um, of today's presentation, a bit in short. And then you get the external audit, where you actually pay external people to check uh, the infrastructure and uh, the applications that you have created. Now, <clears throat> as you might know, uh, information security is not a one-time process. Pen testing is not a one-time process. So you need to have uh, continuous compliance. So you need to continuously check um, whether uh, you're secure or not, you're safe or not. Uh, now let's uh, look at uh, more theory. Uh, you have uh, your web application, you have input and you have output. So obviously, um, the, the ways uh, to leak information is either through, through some sort of uh, malformed input or uh, through information leakage in the output. Um, you might have heard of the OVASP uh, framework. Uh, they collect the top 10 uh, issues of usual issues of web applications. Um, and we are going to talk about them, but we are going to talk about uh, a, a little bit more than that. Here's our internal checklist of what we usually check when uh, deploying an application. Um, here you can see the top 15. Uh, the top 15 vulnerabilities by a German uh, consultancy called uh, Second Suit. Uh, here are the, o the OVASP 10 are shown with this, and these are what we found in both, uh, in both databases. So basically, we've, we just use around 20, uh, we check for around 20 of the most uh, common vulnerabilities. Uh, I wouldn't go into much detail. Uh, we are getting a little bit pressed by time. I'd like to show you some things. But uh, basically, the takeaway from here is that if you sanitize your, uh, if you validate your input, and then you uh, sanitize your output, you're going to be uh, safe from most of You've seen this, I believe. Uh, so if you, input, uh, if you check your input and check your output, you're going to be safe from all of the colored ones. And then you have the error handling, auditing, and logging to check. And uh, you have to check for security misconfigurations, which are not small feats in themselves. Uh, but again. Uh, this has to be still in, in, in the secure coding part. Also, please note, uh, you're as secure as your least secure asset, so you need to secure all the things. Um, probably not visible here, but here we have a very high gate, and then uh, this. So again, uh, back, to, back to our plan. Uh, after, after the secure coding come uh, the internal audit and the external audit. Um, and here we are going to go into a little bit more detail, a little bit more technical detail. Um, I have here, uh, to emulate an attack, you, usually, you would usually use um, uh, some, some sort of an attack vector. Uh, so the, the, the thing to... The, the, you could use ZAP, for example. Uh, Z Attack Proxy uh, is what it stands for. It's created by OVASP. I'm going to talk about uh, other alternatives in a little while. But what I've done here, um, why it's used, for example, if you need a login for, uh, for a given system, uh, you create a man-in-the-middle situation on your own PC where you use uh, the, Z the ZAP application as a proxy for your requests. So it collects all your cookies, and then it can use your cookies to actually crawl the whole site. Here you can see um, I've, uh, I've done a, a pen test, actually, of uh, the OpenFest IT Bookshelf application. Uh, I don't like those guys, by the way. Uh, 
pretty, pretty weak on the security side, I would tell you. So uh, here you, you, you push it uh, against, uh, against an application, and then uh, it comes up with alerts. So for example, here, a cookie has been set without the HTTP-only flag, so you can access that cookie via JavaScript. So this is an open gate for cross-site scripting. Uh, then you have, for example, the way uh, your credentials are communicated. Uh, which is more or less the same. Uh, whenever you post your credentials, it's, it doesn't use the HTTP only flag. And then you go ahead and uh, take a look at, at all of those uh, of the, all of those issues. And this is really cheap, and you can do it yourself. Um, and uh, if you do it yourself, uh, you are doing some sort of information security already. Um, what usually uh, external penetration testers would do is not only use that, uh, but they're going to go ahead and uh, check for false positives in the reports. They're going to check your code, and they're going to come up with uh, suggestions on how you can fix it. And this is the difference between an internal audit, where you have to uh, find out a lot of the things yourself, and then uh, paying, actually, for, for an external audit. Um, let me check what else we have as to set up here. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I've ran a OpenVAS, is another open source application which uh, deals with uh, securing your, your own uh, servers or environments where you can start testing your, your servers for, uh, for known vulnerabilities. For example, here I have actually, I'm I installed it only last night, so um, they, it found a critical vulnerability where I'm using the default uh, admin credentials for, for, for that application. But it also found uh, problems with my weak ciphers for SSL. Uh, and, and, and other issues, for example, here, Pudo SSL version 2 controls uh, CRC ciphers. And we can go into details, but I don't believe it would be as interesting as it should be. So right, this is the plan. Um, we've covered some of the internal audits and some of the external audits. And let's talk about the tools that, uh, that are good for, for, for testing. So first of all, you have the Wireshark. Wireshark you can use for, to, to monitor any network traffic. Um, but it doesn't understand. So some of its weaknesses, it, it wouldn't understand HTTPS. Uh, or any encrypted traffic, but it's going to show you uh, the, the layer two, layer three uh, traffic uh, and, and what's going on on your network, uh, how are uh, requests coming in from where, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it would sniff, so it, it, it's really good at uh, it's really good at that. Um, Z proxy attack we, we've already seen. It's Java based, so uh, platform agnostic, which is good. Uh, and it uh, really does a man-in-the-middle attack from your own PC. Um, it, use, it can use WebSockets, and it's an OVASP tool, so it's, it's safe uh, to use. Burp suit sits on top of, uh, I would say, uh, Z, Zap. Um, and uh, it also does a lot of other things, plus it has uh, a lot of custom scripting in it. So for example, you can, as we, as we talked about reconnaissance, you can collect uh, email credentials from well-known leaks, and then you can try and log into application automated through, through, through Burp Suit. So Burp Suit is really good, and, it, and it's even better if you pay for it. So the commercial, uh, the commercial part is uh, better yet, but Burp Suit, which is not commercial, is also usable. Then we have another OVASP2, um, which is really uh, getting better and better by the day. Uh, it's called the Not XS, uh, XSS Exploit Framework. So it's ba basically a framework, but it also supports three different browsers, which you rarely see with, uh, uh, with uh, cross-site scripting uh, frameworks. It, it supports Internet Explorer, it supports Chrome, and it supports Firefox. And it has, uh, as it's a framework, it would uh, wrap your code into the into the three browsers uh, preferred way so it, it can go undetected it has a database of uh, almost 5000 uh, exploits and uh, it's really it's really easy to create a, a proof of concept code 
uh, for the leaks. Uh, here we have a, some, some other non-free uh, and non-open source alternatives uh, for your consideration. For your consideration, Acunetics is probably one of the best. Then we have uh, IBM App Scanner, Nexpose, Qualys, and Web Inspect by HP, um, which are enterprise level. I mean, I wouldn't use them, but uh, you're free to choose. Uh, and last but not least, um, I usually uh, go ahead uh, whenever we deliver an application and uh, go through this checklist. Um, at least the minimal one, and then, oh, then we have the full one. So what you should expect from a pen test and what you shouldn't. Uh, results from the automated testing. So usually any pen test should have an automated part. For example, what I've shown with Zap. Uh, then you would have analysis and validation of the automated test. So some a human would go through the uh, through the uh, through the results and would analyze them and would check what's going on. Then uh, you would have also, especially if you provided some code or some knowledge of uh, some knowledge of the infrastructure, you would have uh, manually uh, manual manually developed vulnerabilities. By the way, I didn't mention that, and it's pretty important. Don't rely only on automated tests. Automated tests usually work with uh, well-known configurations. So especially if you're writing custom code, uh, you, you should really consider uh, asking someone to, to test manually uh, your site. Uh, and, and the automated tools are just a reference. And last but not least, uh, a report with risk prioritization. And why risk prioritization is important? Because then you, you'll be able to have a leverage on the business people, and you'll be able to tell them, well, look, we have uh, this vulnerability and that one, uh, so please, uh, please consider investing uh, some sort of a budget into fixing those things. Um, a good to have checklist here, risk scoring methodology, and uh, benchmarking uh, with other uh, play uh, players in the industry. So for example, uh, if you're a web company, you would consider, you would start, and, and you deli deliver, sorry, and you deliver an application to a banking, uh, uh, to a banking entity, then you need to adhere to the banking standards. System of, uh, for, for uh, risk management. This again is very important for the governance and uh, how you invest, uh, how much you're going to invest in, in fixing the issues. Uh, a secondary test after you fixed uh, your vulnerabilities. Uh, security awareness training, really important, especially if you'd like to cover the social aspect of pen testing. Spare phishing test of the, uh, of the team, sorry, uh, which has to do with, uh, with the security awareness training. You can do one before and one after uh, the, the awareness training just to measure how effective it has been. Um, if you spare fish your team once, it's really easy to, to spare fish them a second time. Then you have social engineering. For example, you ask somebody to imposter uh, as a support personnel. And then you have uh, DDoS modeling. I think I have a few, uh, a few links on that. Vice is a really interesting uh, magazine that uh, deals with what's going, what's fresh in the world. Blame the kids. Yeah, DDoS tools are really, really easy to download. Uh, this one uh, can crack into a lot of uh, Internet of Things uh, hardware. I would say, and uh, it can use you can use it to d DDoS model your application and, and the response. Uh, so yeah, the next thing, the last thing I would ask you is whether you're paranoid enough. If you're not, uh, we can talk about it later. And uh, with that, I'd like uh, I'll ask you for any questions that you might have. Uh, you're welcome to shoot. All right, so as you already know from yesterday, this hall has three emergency microphones for questions, one in the bottom, one in the middle, and this one. So you can go on the red carpet behind one of the microphones or just raise your hand and I'll come to you and uh, you can ask a question. Uh, I'm gonna show you some uh 
not sure if you follow uh, this uh, Twitter account. Uh, it's called uh, Taylor Swift uh, on security. So it, ha it, it has a lot of memes in there. So for each, uh, for each, uh, of the, uh, for each question, I'm going to show a meme. You can Google them afterwards. They're pretty funny, or at least security information security funny. Good. We have about eight minutes for questions, so go on. Hello. I have a question. Um, uh, it's uh, it's about a malware who steals uh, SSH key uh, with combination with key logger. Do you know such a malware for Linux? Uh, because I met, I'm I already met for Windows, but I I was not sure that there, there is for Linux. Just uh, let me check if I understand correctly. Uh, where do you want to run that malware? Do you want to run it server side no, and no, no, to no. collect I, all I the passwords? I want to run it on a workstation. You you want to run it on? I want to steal a, a, a SSH key da, da, directly. I don't want to break it actually. Uh, I want to steal it. I, I want even to have the the pass for the encryption, the password. There are a million key. ways you can do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, usually. I wouldn't give any advice on that uh, mm -hmm. because uh, my job is actually to keep people safe uh, and not leak. But thanks for the question. Anyway, we can we can discuss it later on. There are certain ways to do that, obviously, but uh, the, the, the easiest way would be to actually own the whole host, which is SSH to whatever to wherever, and uh, have a keylogger there. So that's the most obvious way to do it. And there's a lot of there's a lot of malware out there to do that, uh, but I wouldn't un advertise. Next one. So let's just, let's see the meme first. And <laughs> Lubo raised his hand. So uh, hi, um, I I saw a mention of PLC on one of the slides. Yeah. So my question is, uh, is it uh, usually sufficient to show that there is a vulnerability or there is a well-known vulnerability? Or do your clients want you to provide proof of code or actually to exploit that vulnerability? Uh, OK, I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit more. What we do is uh, we, we build uh, web software. So we test it ourselves. Uh, but we also built uh, software for governance of, uh, of information security vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. I can tell you what we, we work with uh, five of the m largest companies uh, dealing with NSA, CIA, etc. I can tell you what they do. I w I, we don't do it ourselves, that's what I mean. Um, depending on what you pay, because there are uh, different, uh, uh, different packages, you either get uh, somebody to, to check whether you have that vulnerability, or you get somebody to write a code exploiting that vulnerability. So it re because it, it has to do with more or less time, because usually uh, a tester would check if it's working, and it would, it, it would have, he'll have uh, some sort of a very dirty code, piece of code. And if he needs to refine that, that's time and cost. So. For example, if you if you want someone to check whether your code is uh, whether your whether you have that vulnerability or not, uh, that's for example one hour. But if you need a proof of concept, that's uh, another eight hours. Which you, you can do the math yourself. Uh, Two hundred and fifty dollars an hour or something like that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it it's re it really has to do with uh, with your budget and how good, uh, how compliant you need to be. For example, there are international PCI DSS, for example, for finance. Um, you need to, to adhere to that. So usually, uh, another, another, another thing, if you have more juniors than senior people on your team, and somebody says, well, we have a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability, and your team wouldn't understand what that is, then you need proof of concept as well. A little abstract question. Um, is there a way, or do you think there will be a way, to 
punish uh, companies that do not think of security. Because uh, if a company has hired a pen test company, then it already is thinking about its security. But there are yeah. hundreds out there that do not. And uh, that includes not only websites, but also ISPs that, uh, for example, allow DDoS to originate from them. Uh -huh. So do you think of any ways of punishing the... the legally, you mean? Or, or technically? or Because legally, it's pretty easy. P you have uh, PCI DSS. You, you, you force everybody to be compliant with that. Uh, if you think that uh, that's not enough, then you put in more controls in PCI DSS or, or other form of certification for whatever you need. For example, in healthcare, it's called HIPAA. Um, and currently, those are, let's call them a joke. I mean, they are not sufficient. Uh, but if, again, if we are talking about uh, giving a, f a legal framework, then you need to have, uh, I'm, <laughs> again, uh, customizing this, uh, my answer to the, to the guy who's asking. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, you, you need to have a team that, uh, that looks into those things and thinks about that uh, and, and makes uh, the requirements more and more stringent as the threat levels uh, rise. Uh, but I think uh, the most important thing is to push that legislation into China, personally, because the Internet of Things is a joke as well. Uh, and, and not, a, not a funny one, though. Uh, and uh, we need to have some more control over what's going out of, out of there. And we need to have more security controls into, into hardware that is able to, to, to build DDoS uh, monsters and so on and so forth. Did I answer your question? Or if, if not, please. Not parts of it, yeah. But OK, then ask the, the part that I didn't cover. Well, for example, one thing that comes to my mind would be that Google might punish if it has a, a checklist that it can automatically check, then it can punish websites that have lower security, or some other ways like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and they do that. Uh, but uh, that's not sufficient, because uh, the, 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 the guys that, that uh, do the things that uh, we want to, to be saved from, they don't care about their Google ran ranking, I think. S they, uh, they only Some care. So, I mean, I, I not only count for the malicious actors, but also the ignorant and unsuspecting actors. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we talk about Google, and Google builds that into their search engine, uh, then we have a very high cost. Then we are hiring the cost of, uh, of being on top of Google. And then you get uh, the corporations and the enterprises that can uh, have a information security team to be on there on top. And uh, that, uh, a good, like this is a very good example and on, on, a very, on a very good topic. I don't know. We, we, we might need to, to think about that. It's a, it's a, it's a really good topic, and um, it might need a, li a little more research. Because again, um, again, it, it, it's uh, it's it's pushing uh, medium to uh, small to medium business out of the game, basically. Because yeah, ignorance ignorance is a huge problem. I agree with that. Uh, but uh, we need to, to have another framework which isn't direct, which doesn't deal with direct competition somehow. I would say. Thank you. It was an open question, anyways. Yeah, uh, uh, please consider. And if someone would answer it differently, please go ahead. Just a second, so I, I can find the. Yeah. Oh yeah. My favorite one. Go ahead. Um, how do you do uh, threat modeling? for different clients because each each one has different things that they need to be concerned with and you don't want to save everyone from the NSA because this costs a lot of money and you're never really going to do it so how, how do you choose what to invest time and resources in for specific clients yeah so um, different customers have different priorities they keep uh, different uh, config data, confidential data of different magnitude. Uh, so you need to speak their language, business-wise, and tell them, well, you can have like five bands of security. You can be very secure or very insecure. And uh, the two extremes would cost you this much or that much. Uh, 
like the, the one extreme would obviously cost you zero, but then you, you need to have the, the other four numbers. Yeah, uh, and, and you could basically be out of business. And then you need to, to find a way to calculate that. Uh, first of all, you, you can do a preliminary, and most uh, pen test companies do a, pre a preliminary scan. Uh, where they try to estimate how much work would, come, would go into finding uh, most of the issues. And if you're very insecure, the, the cost goes on and on and on. So if you run a business that has an income of, uh, let's say, $10,000 uh, per, uh, per month, you would want to, to try and uh, somehow give the, give the owner of that business a number to invest be it in, in monthly fees or one-time fees or whatever, but you'd like to, to, to help them to their budget. And then you, you, you get into the mentality of who's, go, who's interested in their information and try to, spe to, to specifically guard the business from, from those watering holes. Uh, for example, if you run an online uh, shop, e-commerce site or whatever, um, you try to, to fix your uh, cross-site scripting, uh, CSRF, et cetera, et cetera, or, or any other ways that uh, some guy would abuse your shop and your reputation would be ruined. But also you'd like to, to save your customers from that too. So it's, it's, uh, usually it's a, it's a business question and you need, as a pen tester, to be able to speak that language as well. All right, so time is up. Let's thank Dimitar one more time.